For those of you who are watching online this morning, the title of my sermon is Worldly Desires. We have a wonderful story this morning from the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. The story is about the rich man. Last week I talked about the Synoptic Gospels, and in the Gospel of Matthew, this story is titled The Rich Young Man, and in the Gospel of Luke, this story is titled The Rich Ruler. Regardless of the story, the title of the story, the message is the same in all three Gospels, but I won't give it away until we work through the Scripture. So let's hear these words this morning from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your mother and father. He said to them, Teacher, I have kept all of these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to guide, go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals, it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and field, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Beloved, this is the word of God. For us, the people of God, thanks be to God. Amen. In this very first verse of Scripture, we see that a man runs up to Jesus, kneels before him, and asks him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? There are two things that stand out for us in this first verse of Scripture. The man kneels before Jesus in great respect that he had for him as a teacher who has come from God and in his earnest desire to be taught by him. This man's salutation to Jesus assumes that one can find goodness in human resources and accomplishments. It is highly likely that he identifies himself as good as well. And he asks his question from one good man to another. He wants to know how to ensure that his goodness <clears throat> will pay off in eternal life. He hopes that Jesus can relieve any lingering doubts that he has about his chances and inform him if there is anything missing in the fine print that he needs to worry about. It should be noted here that goodness and salvation do not come from our own valiant efforts, but only as a gift from God. 
His question about eternal life was a serious question, and it is a good and right thing to be concerned with such spiritual matters. While his intentions were good and honest, he and we discover that his heart is not truly right with God. Jesus rebukes this man in the next verse of Scripture. Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Jesus deflects this idle flattery with disapproval of his audacity in thinking that anyone is good except for God alone. In verse 19 we read, You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. It's interesting that Jesus does not quote all of the Ten Commandments, and he does not quote them in order. He quotes just the ones that deal with human relationships with one another. The one commandment that is different is, you shall not defraud. Do not defraud replaces the last commandment of you shall not covet. The switch may be Mark's way of identifying the mode behind defrauding as coveting. By quoting the commandments that deal with human relationships, Jesus teaches this man that doing the will of God has everything to do with how people treat each other. These six commandments, in effect, say, love your neighbor as yourself. This man replies to Jesus, Teacher, I have kept all of these since my youth. This man was pleased to find that he had lived inoffensively from his youth. Ignorance of the extent and spiritual nature of the divine law makes people think they are in better condition than they truly are. I love this next verse of scripture for a couple of reasons. It says, Jesus looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. It says Jesus loved him. I don't know about you, but that statement is so comforting to me. Jesus loves everyone, and he only wants the best for each and every one of us. So he speaks the truth in love to this man. Jesus does not sneer at his claims to have obeyed the law. This man believes what he says about his obedience, but because Jesus loves him, he directly challenges him. Jesus tells this man, go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. I've mentioned before that when I research scripture for a sermon, I read the selected text in eight different translations of the Bible. In the New King James Version, this portion of Scripture says, Go your way, sell what you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, take up your cross, and follow me. Here we are back again to that lesson on discipleship. Take up your cross and follow me. Jesus is instructing this man on the cost of discipleship. Jesus knew that this man's riches had become an idol to him. So Jesus tells him to get rid of his idol and come follow him. That's a lesson for all of us, isn't it? We need to give up whatever has become our worldly desire, our idol in this world. 
For some, that is wealth or the pursuit of wealth. For others, it is a career or status or power. Anything that hinders us from putting God first and foremost in our lives becomes an idol to us and we need to get rid of it. When Jesus told this man to sell all that he had, he was not giving this as a way to salvation. He was showing this man that he had broken the law of God and therefore needed to be saved. Jesus gave him a command of trial by which it would determine whether he truly, sincerely desired eternal life and if he would press on towards the goal of achieving it. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor. On one hand, this invitation to discipleship states explicitly what the twelve had already done. Upon Jesus' command to follow him, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and Levi all left their sources of livelihood to go and follow Jesus. In verse 22 it says, When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. This young man goes away grieving. It is only at this point in the story that Mark tells us why. For he had many possessions. His possessions had become his idol. And if his possessions were his idol, did he really love his neighbor as himself? Because if he did, he could have shared what he had with those in need. The next lesson that we have here it would be a mistake to assume that Jesus is advocating for the renunciation of all of our material possessions. Jesus' words point to an allegiance to God that is not to be superseded by any relationship. Neither family nor material possessions are to supersede one's allegiance to God and to following Jesus. Following is primary, not the renunciation of possessions. However, the shortness of life and the imminent return of the Lord teaches us to put our money to work for him now. After he returns, it is too late. At the beginning of the book of James in chapter 5, it provides a warning to rich oppressors, and it says this. Come now, you rich people, weep and wail for the miseries that are coming to you. Your riches have rotted and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have rusted, and their rust will be evidence against you, and it will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up your treasures for the last days. A little later on, it goes on to say, You have lived on the earth in luxury and in pleasure and have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. That scripture also reminds me of the story of the rich man and Lazarus in the 16th chapter of Luke. The rich man was dressed in purple and fine linen and feasted sumptuously every day. And every day Lazarus laid at the rich man's gate, hoping to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. When Lazarus died, he was carried, by, or carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. And when the rich man died, he was in Hades, where he was being tormented. When the rich man called out to Abraham from Hades, Abraham said, Child, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you 
are being tormented. Let this story from Scripture be a warning about riches and oppression, and let it resonate in our hearts and in our minds. In Matthew chapter 6, it says, Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. So this rich man goes away sad because he does not want to depart with his idol of riches. Instead of putting God first and foremost in his life, he has put worldly desires first in his life. To enter the kingdom of God, we must submit to God's rule so God reigns over every aspect of our lives. Remember, we cannot serve God and wealth. After this man goes away, Jesus looks at his disciples and says to them, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. This truth was very surprising to the disciples. They were astonished at his words. And then Jesus said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Notice that Jesus refers to his disciples as children. This scripture reading that we have here today immediately follows our scripture reading from last week where Jesus told his disciples, Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Perhaps this was Jesus' way of reinforcing that message that we had from last week. Then Jesus says, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus resorts to an exaggerated statement to reinforce the point that those who are ruled by money cannot be ruled by God. This proverbial expression denotes literally a thing that is impossible, but figuratively very difficult. In verses 26 and 27, it says, They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Jesus is referring to the almighty power of God to help even the rich people over the difficulties that lie in the way of their salvation. Let me read verses 28 through 30 for you again, because there's an important lesson in those few verses. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Jesus tells us that anyone who has left their house, family, or fields for his sake and the sake of the gospel will receive these things a hundredfold in this age with persecutions. But he also tells us we will receive eternal life in the age to come. Now Jesus is not actually advocating that we leave these things, but we are to put them second in our life. God and Jesus has to be first and foremost in our lives. Everything else comes second. 
We need to recognize that we receive these things a hundredfold in this age with persecutions. We've been told to expect persecutions in the Gospels and expect to be sufferers for Christ. We will not be out of the reach of persecution until we go home to heaven. Jesus tells us in the 16th chapter of the Gospel of John, in this world you will face persecution, but take courage. I have conquered the world. And we have that promise of eternal life. So let us take comfort in that. Here are the lessons that we have for today. Eternal life is a gift from God. We need to give up whatever has become our worldly desire our idol in this world. We have to put God and Jesus first and foremost in our lives. Everything else comes second. We should expect persecutions in this life, but take courage because Jesus has conquered the world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.